So, you're interested in Baldur's Gate 3, but you're not familiar with D&D 5th edition classes? Tarry no further, as today we will start our breakdown of what you can expect in the early access of BG3. If you like what you see here, please consider subscribing and joining me on Twitch as I fully intend to allow my chat to determine my playthrough on launch. Come join the fun. All, you know, Twitch, Twitter, Discord, that's all below. The Cleric, the Cleric, the Cleric. Ooh, they can play a vital role in your party as you can really refine them to be any one of those major roles, be it heals, damage, or even a tank, depending on how you build them. Before we get too deep, let's learn a little bit more about them directly from the player's handbook. Cleric. Arms and eyes upraised towards the sun and a prayer on his lips, an elf begins to glow with an inner light that spills out to heal his battle-worn companions. Chanting a song of glory, a dwarf swings his axe in a wide swath to cut through the ranks of orcs arrayed against him, shouting praise to the gods with every foe's fall. Calling down a curse upon the forces of undeath, a human lifts her holy symbol as a light pours from it to drive back the zombies crowding in on her companions. Clerics are intermediaries between the mortal world and the distant plains of the gods. As varied as the gods they serve, clerics strive to embody the handiwork of their deities. No ordinary priest, a cleric is imbued with divine magic. Healers and warriors. Divine magic, as this name suggests, is the power of the gods flowing from them into the world. Clerics are conduits for that power, manifesting it as miraculous effects. The gods don't grant this power to everyone who seeks it, but only to those chosen to fulfill a high calling. Harnessing divine magic doesn't rely on study or training, no. A cleric might learn formulaic prayers and ancient rites, but the ability to cast cleric spells relies on devotion and an intuitive sense of a deity's wishes. Clerics combine the helpful magic of healing and in inspiring their allies with spells that harm and hinder foes. They can provoke awe and dread, lay curses of plague or poison, and even call down flames from heaven to consume their enemies. For those evildoers who will benefit most from a mace to the head, clerics depend on their combat training to let them wade into melee with the power of the gods on their side. Divine Agents Not every acolyte or officiant at a temple or shrine is a cleric. Some priests are called to a simple life of temple service, carrying out their god's will through prayer and sacrifice, not by magic and strength of arms. In some cities, priesthood amounts to a political office, viewed as a stepping stone or higher positions of authority and involving no communion with a god at all. True clerics are rare in most hierarchies. When a cleric takes up an adventuring life, it is usually because his or her god demands it. Pursuing the goals of the gods often involves braving danger beyond the walls of civilization, smiting evil, or seeking holy relics in ancient tombs. Many clerics are also expected to protect their deities' worshippers, which can mean fighting rampaging orcs, negotiating peace between warring nations, or sealing a portal that would allow a demon prince to enter the world. Most adventuring clerics maintain some connection to established temples and orders of their faith. A temple might ask for a cleric's aid, or a high priest might be in a position to demand it. As we'll only be able to level up to four in the early access. Let's narrow our initial focus to what we'll obtain up to that point. So let's hold on to this list here for future reference. Also, we should learn a little bit about how to build our blank slate cleric before we get into our subclasses. When choosing our stats or ability scores, we will want to focus most of our points into wisdom as this will be our spellcasting ability. It will determine absolutely everything that involves the knowledge of spells and their strength. The number of known spells for a cleric is determined by your, your wisdom modifier plus your cleric level. These modifiers correlate to your ability scores 
So, if you have a Wisdom of 15, and you are a third level Cleric, you can see that you will know five spells in total. Two from your Wisdom, three from your level. Those can be anything from the first and second tier of spells, as long as you're at level three. That Wisdom modifier will also be added to your spell's attacks, as well as your heals, so there is great incentive to get that number as high as possible. Lastly, when attacking a creature with a spell that requires a wisdom saving throw, the higher your wisdom modifier, the more difficult it will be for them to pass their spell save, as your modifier also increases that difficulty. Secondary stats to consider would be constitution for health, and strength for your weapon attacks. When you're not casting spells, you will typically be on the front lines swinging your mace, so it's advantageous to have a good amount of health as well as strength to do more damage. Speaking of health, let's take a look at exactly how much health a cleric should receive initially. The hit dice for any cleric is a 1d8, meaning you'll roll an eight-sided die to determine how much health you will have. The first level always sets it to a max roll, plus your constitution modifier, but each consecutive level may be determined by a dice roll with your con modifier. I'm hoping they'll provide a checkbox for people who like to play with the average health provided of 5 plus your con modifier. Not everyone is big on letting chance decide your fate. So let's role play a little bit. So at level 1 we automatically have 8 if our constitution modifier is a 2, so we'll have 10 health. Uh, then we get to level 2, and uh, we'll have to roll that 1d8 and add 2 once again, as long as nothing has changed our constitution modifier by. So you could end up with anywhere from 3 health to 10 once again, depending on your roll. Now that we have our health, uh, let's figure out what our starting gear should look like. Right off the bat, Every cleric is proficient in light and medium armor, as well as shields. Now, there are some that will be able to obtain heavy armor proficiency, but we won't know that until we pick our subclass. In actual D&D, we would be given a choice of scale mail, leather armor, or chain mail, if you have that heavy armor proficiency, to start out with. For their melee weapons, they are proficient with all simple weapons and are given a choice between a mace or a warhammer. However, a warhammer is in fact a martial weapon, but once again, some clerics are provided a martial weapon proficiency upon choosing their subclass. Fifth edition also provides the adventurer with a choice of a light crossbow or another simple weapon, a priest pack or an explorer's pack, and lastly, a shield and a holy symbol of your choice. Once again, we don't know exactly what the differences will be in the game. Will packs mean anything? Will clerics get a light crossbow? Not sure. But regardless, we have an idea as to what we should be looking at gear-wise. As far as proficiencies are concerned, we will have bonuses to our Wisdom and Charisma saving throws, and they will allow us to pick two skills that will help flavor our cleric. Uh, th this can be chosen from history, religion, medicine, insight, and persuasion. Now this can really help inform your character's background and what they might have been before they set out on this adventure. For instance, if you want to be a healer in a war-torn country, perhaps medicine and history could be your choices. If you've gotten where you are today because of your keen sense of human emotion, then maybe insight and persuasion will suit you the most. Now, I've been mentioning proficiencies here and there. Between levels 1 and 4, our proficiency bonus is plus 2. What this means is that you'll get a plus 2 bonus when you have a Wisdom or Charisma saving throw, or if you're trying to use one of your skills, if you are, in fact, um, proficient in persuasion, you'll get an additional plus two to that roll. With all that paperwork aside, we can really start digging into the meat of our character now. We have a fairly average cleric with some basic ideas as to what they were like in the past, but 
Now we can finally figure out what's in store for their future. A perk of being a cleric is that you can get to make this decision now instead of at level 3, which most other classes need to get to in order to make this choice. Initially, you'll obtain your choice of three cantrips. If you're not familiar with what a cantrip is, think of them as low-level spells that don't require rest in order to use again. You can just keep slinging these all day as you've used them so often in life that it's become so natural to you, kind of like tying your shoes. They will be weaker, and at least initially, they won't be able to add your wisdom modifier to them. With your cantrips in hand, it's time to make a decision as to which divine domain you would like to focus on. At launch, there will be seven to choose from. But from what I can tell in early access, we will only have a choice of three. Life, Light, and Trickery. Given the limitations of early access, I will only provide information up to level four, as that's all we'll be able to experience. If you find these videos helpful, please let me know so I know whether or not I should make more encompassing all 15 levels we should be able to play at launch. Don't forget to sub and leave your comments below. Let me know what you think. Uh, before I get into each domain, however, it should be noted that every cleric has access to the channel divinity of Turn Undead. A channel divinity is kind of like your daily power. At level four, you can only use one channel divinity until you take a long rest. So you have to be picky about it. But also, you don't want to forget to use it because they can be quite powerful. This particular one will require each undead that you can see or hear to make a wisdom saving throw or be turned for one minute or until it takes damage. Very useful in a pinch. Also at level four, a cleric will be able to improve one ability score by two or two scores by one. You could also forego the ability scores and choose a feat instead which sometimes includes an ability score increase with them. This is typically the route I take, as you'll gain far more power from a feat than you will ability score increases. So what races would boost the cleric's abilities the most? Uh, well, a classic human would actually give every one of your stats a plus one. And I'm hopeful that they will actually add the human variant that limits your ability scores to only two to be increased by one. However, you're able to pick a feat. This can be very powerful in the beginning. But another good option would be a dwarf. Just a, a short, squatty little dwarf as they all come standard with a plus two to their constitution. However, if you go for the sub-race of Mountain Dwarf, you'll get an additional two strength. Or, if you choose Hill Dwarf, you'll actually get a plus one to your wisdom. Both are very, very nice depending on how you want to build your Cleric and what your original stats were. Alright, we're finally here. Let's break down each domain. As I'm sure you don't need me reading each of these spells, I'm going to pop them up on screen as they come up. But if any strike your fancy, just pause and take a read. So let's start off. First one, Life Domain. This is big heels here. So let's read a little bit about what the Life Domain is. The Life Domain focuses on the vibrant, positive energy, one of the fundamental forces of the universe that sustains all life. The gods of life promote vitality and health through healing the sick and wounded, caring for those in need, and driving away the forces of death and undeath. Almost any non-evil deity can claim influence over this domain, particularly agricultural deities, sun gods, gods of healing or endurance, and gods of home and community. Once again, this is going to be your biggest healing output of any cleric, and they're a really darn good tank. So at level 1, you'll gain the proficiency with heavy armors, as we talked about before, as well as learning new spells, Bless and Cure Wounds. Now, when I talk about these level 1 and 3 spells that you learn, these aren't going to interrupt 
the five known spells that we talked about earlier. These are going to be in addition to. So now at level one, you'll have knowledge of seven spells in total that you can use your spell slots on. So as I said, your healing spells are going to be more potent as any spell you cast at level one or higher that regains hit points, that creature will gain two plus the spell's level additional hit points. Okay, so that sounds funny, right? Two plus the spell level. So let's take Cure Wounds, for instance. It's a typically a level one spell, right? If you cast it at level one, you're gonna roll your 1d8 for the, for the heal. You're gonna add your Wisdom modifier, which in our case was two. Then, now that we're a Life Cleric, we're gonna add two again plus the level of the spell slot we used, which in this case was a level one. So in a sense, we're adding five more health to each one of these spells. Now, if we cast this spell at a higher level, not only will the dice roll be increased, but also that final number, if we cast it at you know a second level spell, it'll be a plus two, third level spell plus three, and so on and so forth. At level 2, we will gain a brand new channel divinity option called Preserve Life. Now that we have two channel divinities, we can only still use one of them a day, however we can pick which one we use. But we cannot use both once. We have to pick one and stick with it until we take a long rest. And at level 3, we will gain the Lesser Restoration and Spiritual Weapon spells. Now, Spiritual Weapon is going to be a huge damage deal early on for you, and is an amazing spell to cast. And then finally, once we get to level 4, this is going to be consistent once again with all of them. Uh, we're going to be able to either change our ability scores, or we're going to be able to pick a feat. And that's going to be consistent all through, so I'm not going to uh, reiterate that any longer. So this takes us to the next domain, the Light Domain, or as I call it, the Bright Burn. Gods of Light, promote the ideals of rebirth and renewal, truth, vigilance, and beauty, often using the symbol of the sun. Some of these gods are portrayed as the sun itself, or as a charioteer who guides the sun across the sky. Others are tireless sentinels whose eyes pierce every shadow and see through every deception. Some are deities of beauty and artistry who teach that art is a vessel for the soul's improvement. Clerics of a god of light are enlightened souls, infused with radiance and the power of their god's discerning vision, charged with chasing away lies and burning away darkness. I kind of call this the fire cleric. Now, Light is a more apt name for them, but you also get a lot of burning spells, a lot of fiery spells. At level one, they right away give you the Light Cantrip, if you didn't already have it. So essentially what that means is, if you're going to go Light Domain, when you're picking your first three cantrips, you're not going to pick Light because you're just going to get it automatically here. You also obtain the ability to defend yourself by blinding melee attackers if they try to slice your bits. Using Warding Flare, you can impose disadvantage on enemy attacks by blinding your enemies by the light. They will, however, be revved up like a deuce, another runner in the night, whatever the hell that means. In the last level one perk, you will actually learn two spells, Burning Hands and Fairy Fire. You can start to see there's a lot of light here and there's a lot of fire going on. So at level 2 you gain the channel divinity Radiance of the Dawn, which is a pretty huge AoE damaging spell. Uh, if I remember correctly, it, I believe it's a 2d10 in a 30 foot radius, so a, a 60 foot diameter. That, that's insane. Then finally, at level 3, you learn the spells Flaming Spear and Scorching Ray. So that winds us up with our fiery domain. And last, and certainly not least, especially from its own perspective, is the Trickery Domain. The Nuisance Cleric. 
gods of trickery, are mischief makers and instigators who stand as a constant challenge to the accepted order among both gods and mortals. Their patron of thieves, scoundrels, gamblers, rebels, and liberators, their clerics are a disruptive force in the world, puncturing pride, mocking tyrants, stealing from the rich, freeing captives, and flouting hollow traditions. They prefer subterfuge, pranks, deception, and theft rather than direct confrontation. So yes, the D-bag of the clerics. They want to specialize in deceiving their foes in order to reach their goals. You know, that sounded better in my head. Uh, so let's take a look at their level one. Oh, okay, if they touch another willing creature, mm -hmm, they can provide them with advantage on stealth rolls for up to one hour. Or if the spell is recast. That way you can't recast it on everybody. So, do you got a clunky plateware in the party? <laughs> Cancel out their stealth disadvantage with this! On top of that, they learn the spells Charm Person and Disguise Self, which I gotta say are pretty self-explanatory. At level 2, uh, they gain the channel divinity called Invoke Duplicity, which can create an illusion of yourself that you can cast spells from. So you can send it on the other side of the battlefield. I think it's like 30, 30 feet away, and you can cast spells from over there. Also, if you surround an enemy with you and the duplicate, you gain advantage on your attacks. Very cool. Finally, at level 3, they learn the spells Mirror Image and Pass Through Trace. And I'm pretty sure Pass Through Trace is one of my favorite spells. It grants everyone in the area a plus 10 to their stealth checks, and nothing can track you. It's amazing. I want to see this in the game. But guys, that is it for our, our three clerics that we're going to see in early access. Uh, once again, please subscribe. Follow me on Twitch. Uh, once we get there, hopefully it's uh, not going to get pushed back any further than it already has. Uh, I'm definitely going to be really interacting with chat and seeing where this goes. I'm going to be playing a whole heck of a lot of this. We got to test it out. We got to be jerks. They've requested it, and I'm happy to uh, fill those shoes. Um, but let me know. Let me know what class you're looking forward to, even if it's not in early access, but for the launch, because early access are going to provide us uh, more content over the years as as we go through it. So we'll update these. But thank you so much for watching. You guys have a great day.